namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa bhutang dhammang sankhang namasami So I wish to welcome everybody on this beautiful day. And you're all probably wondering what happened to me. And I probably got into a fight with somebody. <laughs> and so, uh, no, it was perfectly innocent. I just fell down. <laughs> and hit my head on the on a hard floor so it caused this a big bump on the right side the head hit very hard and uh, it was like a, as big as a chicken egg and then uh, and it was easter time <laughs> so I, I don't know quite a, if that's some kind of important connection but that happened about a week and a half ago yeah, when I was visiting Switzerland. And so it's, it's getting much better even though it looks, doesn't look very good. But uh, I've been hiding out since I came back from Switzerland and hoping it would go away. But uh, I thought I might as well use it as as a subject for a reflective talk today for the rest of you. So I was, uh, when I first ordained, well, when I was a Samanera in Nongkai, I was, uh, a Thai monk uh, asked me about Christianity and uh, he asked to, what do Christian angels look like? And so I described uh, what I remember of Christian angels as being white skin, wearing white robes, always being very beautiful with white wings, playing harps. And so he said, oh, that's interesting. And I said, what are Buddhist angels like? And he said, one is an old person, the uh, next one is a sick person. Third one is a dead person. The fourth one is a monk meditating under a tree. <laughs> so I'm using this theme as a representative of old age sickness and monk. I haven't quite died yet. So, and when I do die, the body is still a teaching for you all. And what, what is it teaching? It's, you know, this is the kind of essence of Buddha Dhamma, is that it's encouraging us to reflect on the way life is. What do we all have to experience as being born as human beings on planet Earth? And old age, you get old, get sick and die. And then the, the symbol of the samana, or the monk, or the religious seeker, is um, a symbol for a way of reflecting on the impermanence of this life, this human form, and, and the endless problems it has with, with old age sickness and with death. And, be able to to see to break out of the illusions we have about it, because the, the illusions we hold are that we are the forms that that we inhabit. That this is what I am. This this old body with a black eye, and uh, 
it's like this. You know, when, when you reflect on it, you're not saying anything wrong with it or it should be otherwise, like being permanently beautiful, like angels never die. They're always beautiful. And uh, there's no such thing as an old angel or a dead angel or a sick one and, or an angel meditating. They're always singing beautiful music up in heaven playing harps. But then the, in the essence of Buddha Dhamma is to reflect on the way life actually is. Dhamma, when we use, when you, we have this term Dhamma or Dharma, it means the way things are, the truth of the way things are, the way it is. And so you're not asked to believe in something, some kind of metaphysical idea of Dharma as some kind of creator god or illusory force or some natural force that influences us, but it's learning to wake up and recognize the way things are as we experience them in these forms, these human bodies. It's like this. So it's, uh, and I thought this was, you know, then I, I hadn't really meditated very much then, but I never forgot that story about the four Buddhist angels are not beautiful <laughs> and playing harps and singing beautiful music forever in heaven, but it's about the reality of being born as in a form like this, a physical human body that's conscious with eyes, ears, nose, tongue, to experience through these senses the objects of the senses. So we, we, you know, we have eyes to, in order to witness the spring day, the flowers blooming in, uh, in the trees and everything changing into springtime at this, on this particular day on Sunday. But the ignorance, or what we call in Pali avicca, ignorance of the way it is, ignorance of Dhamma, is is a belief that that one is a, a, a mortal, limited form, bound into a lifetime that's inevitably going to get old, get sick, and die. And that's the way most people do believe. That's their belief. That's what we've, most of us have been uh, conditioned by, by those kind of teachings, that we are these very imperfect forms, that, that uh, we have to prove ourselves by being virtuous and good, and that we, we can be an atheist or a theist, or we can believe in various deities, natural spirits, in the, uh, like pagan spirits and so forth. We can believe almost anything that we're told. And belief is, is handed down to us. It's not Dhamma, it's not the way things are. It's, it's made like the Christian angels are, how it would be nice if there were, actually were these beautiful uh, creatures living permanently in bliss and singing beautiful music. So the, the difference between belief and faith, because oftentimes we, we mix the two up. We believe in, the, uh, we actually believe that faith is a form of belief. But when, when people ask me about my faith in Dhamma, it isn't like I believe that there is something called Dhamma, that I've been told I, if I'm a Buddhist, I'm a Buddhist monk, I should believe in Dhamma. I was never told that by any monk throughout these decades of being a, a bhikkhu. But in, in, like Lung Po Chao was always encouraging meditation, practice, to find out for yourself the way things are. 
So in terms of explaining the word Dhamma to uh, uh, non-Buddhists, you have to talk about its, ult its ultimate truth. You use these abstract words, ultimate truth, ultimate reality, supreme, supreme truth. Uh, these are beautiful words that convey a very, uh, you know, that it's the best that you could possibly think. But thinking itself is a condition we've acquired. You, it's not something natural to, to the forms that when they were born, like newborn babies don't think, they don't have a language, but they're fully conscious forms. Is the consciousness in the baby, or is the baby in consciousness? This is an important question to ask yourself. Is consciousness uh, just, is it personal, like my consciousness in this body is in this body, and so it's separate from your consciousness? These are questions to ask yourself, to find out what, what is consciousness? So in Buddha Dhamma, consciousness is immeasurable. It has no boundaries. Where the forms are all boundaries. These forms are very limited forms. And as you get older, like at my age, you're, 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 the limitations are even more obvious than when you're younger. So going on a very nice holiday to Geneva, Switzerland, you know, the, the body uh, was very limited in what it could do. So, <clears throat> you know, at first, when I was invited to go there, I thought, well, I don't know about traveling, about going to airports and queues and immigration, and, and then I don't know where we'll be staying in Geneva, and, and so, while I'm still here, before I even go to an airport, I'm thinking about the limitations that, that I'm physically identified with, the, 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 the inability to f balance myself very well. I have to walk with a cane, with a walking stick now. But it's in consciousness, and consciousness doesn't change. The forms change. Old age is a form that's grown old. So it's not going to live forever. You know, its, it's nature is to die, to, be, to get sick, to get weak, to get frail as you, as you get older. The senses aren't so accurate, so clear. And when, and, you know, when I reflected on this before even going to Switzerland, I was thinking, this, I'm thinking about the future. This problem of going through airports, through immigration, through places that I'm not familiar with, you know, it can, you can make that into a rather uh, doubtful experience or whether you should attempt even to try Maybe I should just stay here in my kuti, here at Amaravati, until I drop dead, is one alternative, one idea. But then next month, in May, after the Visakha Puja ceremony, I'll be, I plan to travel to America. I want to visit my sister, uh, who is 90 years old. So she's very limited in her movements. And she used to be very active, kind of like to go on hiking trips, climbing mountains, and so now she's a 90-year-old lady uh, living with her daughter in a very nice place. So when I think about going to, to North America, flying from London to Seattle, which is a 12-hour, 13-hour journey by air, you know, one is thinking about it here. At this time, I can make that into a problem through thought. 
But then, is it really a problem, the actual reality of moving this body? You know, the airlines are very helpful, you know, so going to Geneva was really no problem at all. The, the uh, access to wheelchairs and vehicles to, to help you get through from the, from the entrance to the gate of, to board the airplane. So, I mean, there's uh, things that one can worry about growing old in a personal way. That's very personal. Me, I'm this body and, and uh, having to wait in a queue for immigration as a problem I can create over and over in my mind. Or flying for 13 hours to Seattle. I could make that into something unpleasant while I'm sitting here talking to you. Through what? Through thinking about it. The future is the unknown. But yet, how many of us worry about the future? When you hear the, when you listen to the mass media these days, it's all about wars and climate change and all kinds of changing conditions, unpredictable things that that we, you know, individual human beings cannot control. Because the very nature of phenomena is change. And this the Buddha emphasized endlessly in his teachings, reiterated the impermanence of phenomena. And so when we identify with phenomena as a self, and that's what we do with our th thoughts. You know, on a conventional level, uh, to travel to America, I have to have a passport with a name on it, uh, and I have to, you know, get, get airlines to reserve a seat on an airplane. And uh, so I'm, you know, on a conventional level, a separate person that's going to travel on a separate plane from London to Seattle as, as this kind of old form, age, old body, sitting in a, in a seat on an airplane for 13 hours. That's thinking, that's believing I am, really am this, this old body. And seeing, and my thought process is highly conditioned to think in a certain way. So the thinking process, remember, in Amaravati is very international. So even in the Sangha of monks and nuns, it's, they're all different nationalities. They're not just one nationality, one race. But even in a form like this, it's still, you know, we identify with the form that's still limited. Being a monk or being a nun is still a limitation. It's a convention, meaning that we create conventions. They, they're artifices that we can cling to without reflection, without wisdom, without understanding or learning from them. So that's what happens in religions, so many religions, including Buddhism. There's so much attachment to the forms, the, the conventions of a religious, of a, a separate religion, which are, conventions be quite different, just like Thai angels, Buddhist angels, and Christian angels are very different. So what is an angel? Or what, you know, and so is a, in terms of, this is a Christian word, but they're meant to be like beautiful beings that live forever, immortal, and that's, those are thoughts in the mind that we create, coming out of this particular, out of a particular Christian tradition. Or we can not believe in angels. We look at pictures of Renaissance paintings and see angels as little cupids, little naked little babies floating up in the sky with wings on them. And, or, you know, so you can create an angel into any beautiful form. They're, they're all beautiful. 
But old age is not beautiful. Sickness, COVID-19, this is not beautiful. And death, corpse, human corpse, so that, uh, it's not beautiful to look at. A Buddhist samana, shaven head, rag robes, this is not creating beautiful forms to, to you know, to look at, uh, to make us look beautiful, but they're forms for reflection. What is the point of being a monk or a nun? Is, is it some kind of identity you want? You know, to become a bhikkhu or bhikkhuni or something that is, is that you read about in a book, in the scripture, that you hear about, to become something that you think you'd like to become and attach to that form? Or is the form a convention for helping us to reflect on Dhamma the way things are? So this is one thing I really appreciate in the Theravada Buddhist tradition is the emphasis on this reflective ability, mindfulness, awareness, conscious awareness, intuitive awareness are the words we use for it, is the very essence of Buddha Dhamma, of the whole essence of the Buddha's teaching. So it's a opportunity, an invitation to investigate life, to investigate what you believe in and what you, you know, the limitations that we experience through these forms. So, you know, this is, this is quite a challenge for most of us. Because we'd like to, you know, just like the word enlightenment, we'd like to become enlightened as an individual separate person, you know, so enlightenment is very, uh, you know, a word that, that creates this desire to become something that we feel we are. We, we're so limited and bound to the form, the human form, that we, we, we think, it, you know, we, we in some ways acknowledge the limitations because we all see our parents getting old. We all have to experience sickness, weakness. In the past two years, just the COVID pandemic has been a great teacher for us. But how many are willing to learn from COVID or from aging parents or from aging monks or nuns? You know, how many of you young monks or nuns are willing to learn and see the teacher is about old age, about a samana, who's a devaduta, an old human body that is a devaduta, a Buddhist angel, and this is the way it is. So this black eye, and my walking in this room, well, walking stick, depending upon another monk for support, this is the way it is. This is an old form that's tired and wearing out. And if I identify with it out of habit, out of my ego, the sense of my separate self, then I don't want to get old or get sick. I don't want to have COVID. I don't want to die. Or maybe I do want to die. Maybe I'm depressed and thinking life is pointless. I just want to get it over with. It's still a creation of the mind. You haven't learned anything yet from these various obvious, very realistic teachers so sometimes we go around looking for perfect teachers. You know, so in Thailand, for example, in, uh, when I was a junior monk at Wat Pa Pong, you know, there'd be people coming from Europe, America, to try to find the perfect teacher, the enlightened arahant looking for a Buddhist monk who's 
who claims to be enlightened and, and seems to act enlightened. And so, uh, you know, I used to get so fed up dealing with these people because at that time I was a translator for Ajahn Chah. And so one day the, some Western people came, young Westerners came, there. this was in the, the 70s, early 70s, or late 60s, that uh, all the hippies, uh, the hippie movement in, the, in the America, a lot of them were coming to India, to Asia, to find drugs or gurus or teachers. <clears throat> and so they'd come to Thailand, they'd hear about Lung Pao Cha and Wat Pa Pong in, in uh, Ubon province, a remote province in Thailand. It's not on the main track there for tourism. And they're looking to see if Ajahn Chah is an Arahant, if he's enlightened. And so some of them believe that he is, and some believe that he isn't. So this word enlightenment and Arahant are words, artificial words, they're artifices that we create that we create with thoughts, with ideas of perfection, of human perfection, of using to have, have a separate form like myself, Ajahn Sumedho, as it become an arahant, as some kind of attain, personal attainment. Is that using wisdom or understanding or investigating the way things are, investigating Dhamma? Because the very words Ajahn Sumedho are artificial words. The body is a condition of the four elements, earth, fire, water, and air, in space. Its very nature is impermanent, unstable, insecure. The whole idea that I am this limited, frail, fragile, aging, old form is... Um, make, you know, is the creation of suffering because getting old, getting sick and dying, and these are not ideal goals, you know, or enlightenment, becoming enlightened, becoming perfect as an individual. It sounds very good, but is it possible? Can these forms ever become perfect? Because their very nature is to get old, get sick and die. So the fourth Devaduta, the Samana, a alms mendicant, and it's usually represented in Thai iconography as a, a shaven-headed, orange-robed monk sitting under a tree. That's the icon, that's the, art, art, uh, that's the artistic approach. What, what does that mean? What does it mean? in a society that is based so much based on the superstitions, the beliefs of being a separate person in a, in a universe that we can't control or have very little, a little ability. And as we get older, we, we lose even that youthful ability to, to control life in a certain way. We have to learn, like I see, in, in this form as an aging monk, it, the, the teacher is old age. It's this black eye that's teaching me. It's this, this skin that easily bruises. It's the failing senses, the, the blurred vision, the, the deafness in the ears. This is all a devaduta for me, rather than some kind of personal disability which is what it seems like on the conventional level. So this emphasis on bati bata, or investigation, and that's where my emphasis on the Four Noble Truths, as you are very much aware of, this is the basic teaching of the Buddha that's handed down through tradition, through conventions, so that we can use it 
at this time, in this place, but it is a convention, but it's not a belief. It's not about, to become enlightened, you have to believe in Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha. Or some people will say you have to believe in reincarnation. Or you have to believe in karma, personal karma. That's one of the words that, that's taken from uh, Samana traditions, from India, from Asian countries, Buddhist or Hindu religions into the Western world, and so karma becomes personal. What's your karma? And uh, anything that happens this old age is my karma. And still, I'm by very, that very saying, saying old age is my karma, uh, is making old age very personal. It's one way of kind of accepting old age as an individual person. You know, it's kind of psychologically skillful that because I was born and have lived this long, the body's old, it's my karma. But that's not investigating karma or dhamma or the way it is. It's believing that you are the actual creature that was born, that's grown up, get old, and will die in the future. And of course, birth is the, the cause of death. You know, something that's never born never dies. <clears throat> So that's karma, cause and effect. The conditioned realm is all about cause and effect. Just like the, the spring day or here at Amaravati. You know, changing from winter to spring, then summer, then autumn, then winter again. The, the, you know, the changing seasons in England are really remarkable because they're quite so obvious. The, the extreme extreme changes that take place in just what we see in the English countryside through just one year of, of observing the way things are. Would we like it to be per permanent spring? You know, on one level we would. Permanent, permanent summer, have all the flowers permanently situated here you know, without change, with leaves on the trees. That's an ideal, you know, that we are very attached to, is the idea of beauty and youth and health and success and power and wealth. So modern society, materialistic society, is very much based on these ideas of trying to make things permanent as long or as personal and as permanent as you possibly can. How to extend the lifespan of an individual human being. How can we get rid of death? We've heard that many times in the mass media. How do, do they have treatments now to make you live 500 years? And, um, you know, can we become immortal? Can these forms ever become immortal forms? They're not like angels, Christian angels, that are forever beautiful, but they're just imagination. They don't, they aren't made out of the, the four elements, earth, fire, water, and air. They're images in consciousness. These forms that we identify with and bind ourselves to, limit ourselves to the, to the limitation of a human body, is a condition in consciousness. So when the forms pass away and change, consciousness doesn't pass away or change. We experience consciousness, we identify consciousness with the senses, with seeing, with the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, with the mind, mental states so that we think as we grow old, you know, we, the, the vision fades, the hearing fades, you can, your senses aren't so alert, so accurate, the body fades. 
But on conscious level, you know, when one is investigating Dhamma, one begins, one begins to awaken to Dhamma itself, the reality of conscious awareness that is possible that the Buddha pointed to very clearly in his teaching of the Four Noble Truths. So, you know, like in Wat Pong, I remember in those early years of learning Thai language and, and learning to adjust to life within a, a forest monastery in northeast Thailand, the emphasis was, Lung Po Cha was always saying, you learn from the elderly nuns, monks. So one day I was, there was an old monk uh, a Thai monk who was very good natured. I really liked him. Personally, we were good friends. He ordained late in life after his wife died and his family uh, were married off and he didn't have any more thing to do than to ordain as a monk. So uh, he was a late comer. And so, uh, you know, Lung Po Cha asked me what I learned from this old monk. And uh, I, I was trying to be nice and say, well, he teaches me Dhamma and uh, is very kind to me. And, and Lung Pocha said, no, no, he's teaching about old age because he just came from a branch monastery where he had a big argument over food with another monk. So, so you know, I didn't know that, you know, I thought, I just see the, you know, what I want to see or project onto various people my own desires for them to be a certain way. Living in a community, that's what we do. We project onto each other all kinds of conditions, qualities, ideas about who's good, who's enlightened, who isn't, who's hopeless, who will become enlightened who won't, who is, whose karma is not good enough to become enlightened, we can believe in all kinds of things that we read in scriptures. Because scriptures themselves are artifices, they're not the end of the, of the teaching. You know, fortunately we have the scriptures, the suttas, But just learning the suttas is not, you know, you, you can't attain enlightenment through reading the scriptures. As if you still have this basic delusion of belief without investigation. So this, this first sermon of the Buddha, the Four Noble Truths, that's a, in its very essence, it's very, you know, I consider it perfect teaching. Just Four Noble Truths, you don't have to spend uh, a lifetime studying Pali Sanskrit and memorizing uh, Pali chants. To even chant the Four Noble Truths in Pali doesn't take that long, anybody can do it. So chanting the Dhamma Jaka Pavatana Sutta is a good, Thing to do, but it, it's not enlightening until we investigate, and that's that's the very essence of of the, using suffering as a noble truth to investigate what is suffering. Like just in, when I was t talking about previously flying to Geneva before I even got there, when I was sitting here in Amravati the suffering of thinking about all the difficulties I might experience physically uh, traveling through airports and so forth. When I cling to that kind of thinking, when I identify with that thinking, then I begin to recognize this is suffering. I'm suffering because I'm sitting in a nice place here at Amravati thinking about the possibilities of suffering in the future, when actually the suffering is what I'm creating in the very present. 
this worry, this concern, this anxiety is what I create with thoughts, with habit patterns of thinking. The conventional level is a lot to worry about because it is unstable. Climate is a lot, you know, one can worry about the climate. Climate change is a very important subject worldwide now. It's an endless source of conversation and disagreement. Is it, if we behave ourselves and stop using coal and, and carbon dioxide emitting substances, can we slow down or stop the climate change? You know, these are interesting questions. Can we, just as human beings in mass, the world's population, if we, we start using just solar power or wind power and get rid of, uh, of all the vehicles and industries and so forth that emit carbon dioxide, will that stop climate change or slow it down or whatever? We don't know. That we don't know. And then we know we don't know is like this. Not knowing about the future of the climate of planet Earth is like this. So I start seeing this anxiety about the climate. By attaching to it, I suffer, which is the first noble truth. Then I'm going to spend the day sitting in my kuti worrying about the conditions of humanity on planet Earth in the future. And then I can think, well, I'm glad I'm 87 going on 88 because I won't be around that much longer. But then many of you have got to live through many more decades of existence within these limited forms. So even death, the possibility of the body dying, if seen in a personal way, is suffering. Whether I just want to die or don't want to die, it's still based on me thinking about I am this physical body, this old form, that's going to die. And maybe I'm fed up with life and want to die. Maybe I would like to live to 120. I mean, these are possibilities for thought for creations for ambition, to be uh, a, a monk that lives to 120 years is highly approved of and, and regarded very highly in Buddhist countries. So thinking itself, you're aware of thinking. Thinking can't be aware of thinking. You can't think and be aware and thinking, a thought can't be aware of itself, but you're aware of the thought. This awareness is the gate to the deathless. What is immortal? What is deathless, which is not created, not bound by karmic conditions? That we can, that is available to us at this moment without belief, without believing in what we're told, but through investigating the reality of conscious experience as we experience life through these limited forms which we can take very personally. So this first noble truth, you know, just by using over the years, I've used this for over 50 years, just this basic teaching. And this is what I remember when my life with Lung Po Cha in Thailand was how I emphasized this teaching over and over again. And I found that this teaching very, you know, because it, it is simple, it's not Four, no, four Noble Truths is not a complicated thing to memorize or remember. But because of that, we can ignore them because there's much more. There's Abhidhamma, there's all kinds of 
philosophical, metaphysical, intellectual possibilities that are available to all of us at this time, all information, interesting subjects to contemplate, all religions, philosophy, science, physics, uh, you know, available to the common individual through the internet, through modern technology. But is the modern technology, it's in consciousness. It's not conscious of anything. It's, it's made out of earth, fire, water, and air elements in space. But it, it can't be conscious. These separate forms, human forms, are conscious forms. So we're aware. This is awareness. Awareness of aging is like this. Sitting here in this chair with a black eye is like this. Because everybody, when they first see me, are wondering whether I was in a fight or was I attacked while I was away. You know, you can imagine all kinds of dreadful things. An old monk like this body here uh, being attacked by hoodlums. It's possibility, it's imagination. But even if that were the case, the Bhati Bhattar, the reflective practice that I've used for over 50 years is to reflect on it. It's like this. So when I wake up in the morning, I just notice it's like this, to wake up. The food I get is like this. I still enjoy eating at this age. So <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the few senses that one can still quite enjoy. I can't hardly read now. I'm no longer interested in sensory stimulation. You lose that interest and fascination for distracting through the senses. But this reflectability isn't dependent upon formal retreats or perfect situations, but learning to trust and recognize in each one of us, whether you're a Sangha member or a lay person, male or female, that we share this consciousness, these, all these forms sitting in the, this temple today, and the consciousness is the same for all of us. The forms are different. And this is important, you know, even this is information you can believe in, but I'm not asking you to believe it, but to reflect on it. What is consciousness that here and now is not a thought, not an emotion, not a feeling, because we are aware of what we're feeling. We know when we're angry, when we're greedy, when we're hungry, when we're tired. We know that the body's old now, it's like this. We know that springtime in England is like this. We know this through conscious awareness, through the senses, but beyond the limitation of the senses, because they're fragile and easily uh, deteriorate, is pure awareness, pure conscious awareness. And it, it doesn't cease because of the senses deteriorate or the body gets old. So in the third noble truth, the, the, the realization of the end of suffering, don't think that by meditating seriously all these years that you're going to end suffering as a separate person. You can't do it. As long as you're 
identity is with the form, a physical form, you know, it's, it's going to get old, get sick, and die anyway, whether you're considered enlightened or not. But what is it that is aware of old age is like this, that is aware of uh, fading, blurry vision is like this? Is it Ajahn Sumedho that's aware of his blurry vision, or is there pure awareness very vision is, is what's happened to the senses, the eyes are like this. And that's the way it is. And so and there's no attachment to that. It's not, a, it's not the condition, the cause of suffering is attachment to these forms, to avicca, to ignorance, through beliefs, through conditioning, that is the cause of suffering. So the, the, the emphasis the Buddha made was to let go of the forms. That means to get rid of them, annihilate them. No matter how wise you realize these Four Noble Truths, at the end of your life, the body still gets old, gets sick and dies. And that's what it's supposed to do. And when we realize that, that we're not these mortal limited forms that we, that are the, you know, which are going to change and not always change the way we want them to, when we realize what we really are, this, the, the Buddha pointed to it very clearly, is this pure, aware, conscious awareness or Dhamma, Dhamma is that supreme reality, ultimate reality, whatever that is. And that's what we know we are, we're conscious. So you know you're conscious. So it's, it's here and now, it's not about learning to become more conscious, but our allowing wisdom through this investigation to direct your life so you learn to let go, not get rid of or annihilate the forms. The suicide is not the answer. This form, you know, you can kill the form. But the, but the unenlightened being is just, you know, doesn't know what he's doing, he or she is doing. They're just, thinking that they're getting rid of suffering through, through annihilation of forms. It's not about annihilation, but about this opportunity that we have as human individuals, human beings, to reflect on consciousness, from consciousness to the way things are as we experience them through these forms and through the senses. So that's the end of suffering. So when people ask me, do I still suffer? Are they pointing to the to Ajahn Sumato as a physical form? Is it suffering to to have a black eye? Is it suffering to not be able to walk very well or lose your balance? Is it suffering to get COVID? Is it suffering to uh, you know, to, to, to just experience the fading of the senses. It can be suffering if, if there's blind attachment to the idea that I as a person want to have perfect vision forever, or I as a separate person want to have perfect hearing and don't want to get disabled with the body and its, and its inabilities as it ages. That's suffering. That's attachment to ideas, to thoughts, to images. And that very suffering is the, the second noble truth about letting go of these images, 
by understanding how impermanent these images are. The four elements really investigate earth, fire, water, and air, the solid, the liquid, the heat, the air element, that is all, and the space that these elements need to manifest in are what we're experiencing here and now. And changing your attitude from personally identifying, judging yourself according to value judgments you acquire through thoughts of what's right and wrong, what's good and bad, you'll never see the end of suffering in this lifetime. But you can know the end of suffering through letting go, not through annihilating or ignoring, but through recognizing ignorance is an acquired condition. It's not permanent. It's not personal. Avicca or ignorance is like this. It's believing in the very conditioning, the cultural conditioning, the egos that we identify with, the belief that we are these fragile human forms in a vast, mysterious universe. Just by believing in those images, without question, without understanding, is the cause of suffering. So after we realize, we let go of those images, the eyes are still functional, hearing. Planet Earth is like this. The sun and moon stars are like this. When you get sick, it's like this. When you get old, it's like this. So you're, you're the witness to the changing conditions rather than becoming the conditions that change. So I offer this as a reflection for this afternoon.